Hello, and welcome to today's episode of Books in the World, a presentation of the Cape Cod Writers' Center. Our book today brings us back in American history to the Civil War of the 1860s. And the author of our book, our book today, Michael McCarthy, we welcome you to the program. Thank you very much. And we welcome your book, Confederate Waterloo. Right. Waterloo, well, uh, it would seem to indicate the end of things, or but your story starts with the Battle of Five Forks, which is the beginning of end of things, if I read you correctly. That would be accurate, yes. <laughs> that uh, um, The name Water, Confederate Waterloo was actually coined by a Confederate officer, uh, General Munford, who fought in the Battle of Five Forks. And his view was that it was Five Forks that permanent or totally collapsed Lee's defense of Petersburg, which had been going on for nine months, and forced them to retreat that went to the Appomattox where they surrendered. So it was the culminating battle or in his mind. Where is Five Forks? Five Forks is about 10 miles west of Petersburg, Virginia. Uh, Petersburg was where the fighting was for months. Petersburg and Richmond were linked. Petersburg was the, the center for railroads that provided supplies to Richmond. And the defense of Richmond was critical, uh, Petersburg was critical to the defense of Richmond. So Peters Richmond was north of Petersburg, Five Forks is west. Grant was moving his army, constantly moving west, trying to get around Lee's army, which was trying to defend Petersburg and stretching his lines for months. So he was trying, Grant's army was trying to come around the other side. Right, come around the other side cut and, off. and cut off the railroad. Now the last railroad that the Confederates had for supplies was called the South Side Railroad and that ran from Petersburg west into North Carolina. And that was what the Battle of Five Forks was aiming toward. The, the Union forces were attempting to cut that last railroad, and by winning the Battle of Five Forks, they were able to do that, and Lee had no, no source of supplies, so he had to abandon Petersburg and Richmond and move west, and trying that, to... And that was indicative of the collapse of the Confederate Army? Yes, because he could not get away from the, the Army of the Potomac who chased him down at Appomattox. I mean, he was constantly trying to get away and he couldn't, he got caught finally. The, the Union force just caught up with him. He was losing troops as he was running. I mean, any time an army's in retreat, they start to lose troops. They were fighting constant rear guard battles, but at the end, Appomattox was the final result. Now, you're, ob you're obviously more cognizant of the facts of the Civil War than I. So if I ask a kind of an offbeat question, please bring me up to Well, I will try to answer it, and I, I don't think... What, what started your interest in the Civil War? Michael? Well, I, I've always been interested in the Civil War when I was a kid. So that was always an interest. History was my love. I ended up, I started college as a math major, wasn't really good at that, so switched to history, <laughs> got to study the Civil War some, and a lot of other history. I mean, I'm generally a history major, uh, lover. And I was a member of the Civil War Roundtable in Albany. That's where we lived, in Albany, New York. And we went on a trip. They used to go on trips on, on, uh, on Columbus Day, that weekend. We'd go to, on a trip to the south, to one of the battle areas. Went to Petersburg, and we went to this place called Five Forks. And I, and the, the, yeah, I've never heard of Five Forks. And I was very similar. I said, I've sort of heard of Five Forks, but I didn't know much about it. And the the guide, the uh, park ranger that we had, talked about it as being this critical battle. And I said, gee, I, I, I don't know much well, about I'm, it. I'm thinking back, you know, even the little bit of knowledge that we had in school about the Civil War, which was woefully small yes. overall. But you hear of Pickett's Charge and Gettysburg, of course, but you never heard of, never hear of Five Forks right. in well, Virginia. That, well, that's why I thought it was a good thing to write about. But it was, it, I got interested in that, and at the end of the battle, the, the park ranger said, General Sheridan, commander of the Union troops at this battle, and General Warren, second in command, he relieved General Warren of his command. 
after winning a battle, which, you know, if you think of the Union Army, all the battles they lost or the general stayed in charge, and this general was relieved after winning a battle, I thought that was well, sort of interesting and that's, curious. There's intrigue going on. It's very there. much so. But then, going back to Albany, where I worked, found out, he had mentioned it, that General Warren's papers are in the State Library in Albany. And General Warren, after the battle, had spent his life trying to restore his honor, restore his reputation, because it was so humiliating to be basically fired after winning a battle, that he did a complete, he was studying the battle himself. He would write letters to Confederates, to other Union officers, and he would constantly try to get what's called a court of inquiry, where he gets a chance for the U.S. Army to make an opinion on whether he did anything wrong to cause him to be uh, relieved of command. Well, let me backtrack just sure. a moment, Michael. Uh, General Warren was a, a Union Union officer from New York. And he fought in this Five Forks area in Virginia. He was second in command. Second in command, right. And although the Union won that battle, he came out on the short end of history in there. That's correct. General Sheridan, who was the commander, had been told by General Grant before the battle, if you're dissatisfied with General Warren, you are, you are authorized to relieve him. General Sheridan was not Warren's normal commander. Warren was a commander of the 5th Corps Army of the Potomac. He was under General Meade, who was the commander of the Army of the Potomac. But he was sent temporarily to fight this battle with Sheridan, and he was temporarily under Sheridan's command. And Grant sent Sheridan this suggestion that said, if you feel dissatisfied, you're allowed to relieve Warren, almost like a hint. Why yeah. don't you relieve Warren? I'm tired of him. That's, you know, again, you get into the history of this and all kinds of people have different opinions of what the reasons were for various actions. But Sheridan cooked up some arguments why he thought Warren was not adequate at the battle took and relieved him. Warren had no recourse but to ask the Army uh, for a court of inquiry. And, of course, General Grant, who had authorized this action, he was the head of the army, so he wouldn't authorize it. Yeah, he, didn't want to, he didn't want to roil the waters. That's right. He didn't want it. He thought Sheridan was the best thing since sliced bread, and he wasn't going to let anybody criticize Sheridan, which would have been critical if he'd said you relieved him in unfairly. So Warren, spent, he, couldn't get, he couldn't get General Grant to authorize it. Gen General Grant became President Grant, so President Grant wasn't going to authorize it. So Warren spent years and years, he, he gave up being a major general, which is what a corps commander was, went back to his permanent rank in the Army, which was major, and he was, so he stayed in the Army in the Corps of Engineers doing uh, bridge projects on the Mississippi River. He took a huge, huge reduction. Yeah, of rank of, of... But had he resigned... He would never, he'd never get a court of inquiry. He couldn't get a court of inquiry if you're not a soldier anymore. Now, reading your book, Michael, yes, uh, it seems that there were a lot of generals in a comparatively small area. Is that an assumption that is correct, or am I reading well, more into it than there well, is? Well, I think there were the proper, I'd say the proper number of generals for the soldiers. I mean, each, each brigade in an, in an army, either army, would be headed by a brigadier general, and every division would be headed by a, a brigadier general or a major general, and then the corps. So since he had a corps, he had three divisions, and each division had uh, three brigades. So those all got generals, as did Sheridan's force was all cavalry, and they also were set into brigades who also had generals. General, For example, General Custer was one of his, his oh. subordinates. Um, General uh, Chamberlain was another subordinate who people are familiar with. He was on the Fifth Corps. He was in the Fifth Corps, and on the on the other side, General Pickett was the overall commander. But they had the generals of cavalry and five brigades of infantry as well. So there were a good number of generals. Plus, when I wrote this, I sort of stayed at that level. I mean, there were lots of colonels and other people who fought, and, and you you could get into detail. and And some of the criti the criticism of the book has been. He didn't write enough detail about the battle. 
I wrote more, you know, I was aiming more at the aftermath and, and this court of inquiry. So it's the battle, certainly, but because you couldn't possibly write about the aftermath without some knowing about the battle. Yes, but it wasn't a inch by inch, foot by foot kind of, of construction of the battle like you might get in a book on Gettysburg. You know, we have enough books on Gettysburg where you can follow all kinds of soldiers in great detail. That was not my intention in writing about Five Forks. It was to give you a good idea of the battle, but also to understand this, this longer term There were battle. thousands and thousands of men in those battalions, weren't there? You, you write about a group of 10,000 men or another one of 15,000. It seems like an enormous number of people on the ground. Well. The, at the time, uh, Lee's army had about 65,000 men total. That was overall. Overall. And the Union force probably had about 120,000, so they had a significant advantage. At the Battle of Five Forks, uh, Pickett, General Pickett, probably had around 7,000, and the Union probably had around 18,000. But it was generally that the Union had more forces than the Confederates in most battles, especially this time of the war. One of the reasons why the Union was winning is because the Confederacy w was getting worn down and they were just shorter and shorter and shorter of men. Yes, the battle, there's the crux of this book, the Battle of Five Forks, uh, was well along in the war. The war had been on for how long at that time? Well, pretty, almost exactly four years. Yeah. Since a April 1861, this was April, April 1865, so it was just a little bit less than four years. And, uh, and as I read the casualties, which I hit the web for, uh, the Civil War was an enormous slaughter of men and material and horses for that matter, <laughs> right? but uh, an enormous casualty list. Well, you have both sides being Americans, so that when you end four years of tooth and nail fighting, very hard fighting, with lots of big battles, there were more casualties than there were in World War II, for example, in the, for yes. the United States. Yeah, over 300,000? 600,000. Over 600,000 when you tally it all together. Right, including people who got illnesses. More people died of actually disease than died of combat wounds. Oh. Because they had, they had typhoid, uh, diphtheria, uh, measles. They had all kinds of diseases that would kill people. They didn't have very much good treatment. And because they're all camped together, you know, people would, would catch these diseases. Uh, and, oh. and they both, both sides lost uh, more men than in disease, with disease than they got with, uh, with casualties, shooting casualties, bullet wound. But those were awful bad, too. <laughs> I, I laugh for keeping from being distraught about the killing and the death and the injuries and the amputations. And it, was, it was terrible. It was a t just a terrible uh, thing for the d country to go through, uh, both sides. Uh, I mean, there was a story that uh, Mississippi, for example, after the war, 50% of the state budget was for uh, artificial limbs and uh, crutches. Whoa. Because they had so many people who had wounds like that. Yeah. I mean, it was, it was you know. Yeah, I've seen terrible. Brady's pictures or Brady's crew, there were other photographers in this crew too. Right. And just the mass devastation of bodies over uh, Every battle in the Civil War, it seems. That's right. Where did, uh, where did the war go from the Battle of Five Forks? Okay, well, as soon as this battle was over, Grant immediately, when he found out the battle had been won, he immediately ordered his, the rest of his army to attack Petersburg. Meanwhile, General Lee was doing everything he could to evacuate Petersburg. There's a famous story that uh, Jefferson Davis was at church the next, the Sunday after, and he gets a message from Lee saying, you have to evacuate Richmond because I can't hold it more than a day longer. So, so the Confederate government gets out of Richmond as best it can. The Confederate army moves west 
trying to get towards uh, North Carolina. Now in North Carolina, there's another Confederate army under Joseph Johnston, who is fighting General Sherman's army. And they're both also outnumbered, but Lee's plan was to try to combine with that Confederate army and then attack General Sherman's army, defeat them, and then turn around and fight the Grant's people coming in from the, from the west, from, from the, the east. North. Right. So they, they, we were pushed back as far, you know, they were trying to run. They were moving as rapidly as they could, but the, conf the Union cavalry and Union infantry was chasing them and forcing them to fight rear guard battles. And each time they fought, the Confederates would lose more resources and have to, and, and had no ability to stop and get food. They didn't have food, so they were struggling to feed themselves. They were losing ammunition. They were losing army, arms. And when they got to a place called Appomattox Station, which is not Appomattox Courthouse, but it's right oh, next to it. Different place. Different place. They had a large number of rail cars with supplies there. Oh. And General Custer and the Union Cavalry got there before the Confederate infantry and ripped up the, ripped up the, the, the supplies, burned them, tore them up, whatever they could do to get rid So when he got to Appomattox Courthouse, he, was, he had no food. The, by then, the Union Army had gotten on his, let, what his, his right flank was between him and Johnston. He would have to push that part of the Union Army out of the way. And on the last day, they started to attack. This, this is at Appomattox Courthouse. So they attacked that morning. They pushed Sheridan's cavalry out of the way, but the Union had a, a whole corps of infantry behind Sheridan's army and, this, and uh, General Longstreet, who was basically Lee's number one commander, said, we can't, we can't push them out of the way. And Lee said, then I have to go see General Grant. And that was the end of that was, and that, was the end of that army. And after that, it was like a dominoes. Each Confederate army that was in the field around the country, they, they basically quit. Or right, so as I understand, as I understand it, Michael uh, McCarthy, uh, Lee realized that things were ending. Yes. As for the Confederate Army. Uh, it started with, as you say in the book, Confederate Waterloo, it started with the loss of the battle at Five Forks. Right. And then it was just one... One after another. One defeat after another. Right, there were... What sort of armament was used in, World War, in, the, in, the, in the Civil War? Armament or arms? Uh, arms and armament. Okay, well, by this time in the war, the, the Union infantry was still using single-shot uh, musket rifles. Would uh, they have to reload after each After every time. shot, right. So you would shoot, and then you'd take time out, even in battle. Yes, well, you had to. They start lowering power and ball and The ramrod, the bolt, yes, paper. They were, those were still the primary weapon, weapon for the Union infantry. The, the Union cavalry, however, by this time, they had shorter weapons. They had carbines, not rifles and those were breech loading. So they had the ability to fire uh, six or seven shots in a row before they had to reload. And they had cartridges, that, you know, they had what we would consider a modern system that, uh, that they could use. That, that, that kind of armament was fairly new then. Very right? new. Very if, new. It were, if it were not so new, the infantry would have had a comparable weapon. But the infantry weapon was so much bigger, they hadn't yet worked out the proper reloading uh, mechanism effectively. There were some of those rifles and some people bought them and some, but the army itself, the United States government had not purchased a huge number of them to, uh, they, they weren't in common manufacture. They couldn't provide enough. I can just visualize the mayhem and the slaughter that would go on while a rifleman is reloading a musket. Uh, and the time involved and the procedure involved, and meanwhile, the shots are flying all over. Well, true, but it's the other side has the same weapon. So the Confederates are using the same weapon. So they both have to do that same function. They have to reload back and forth. So it wasn't like there was an advantage. Uh, and that's why you often had volley fire, where they'd all fire at once, or half would fire, and then the other half would reload. You know, they would have procedures oh, to uh -huh. make sure that they had enough fire going out to protect themselves from anybody just charging them when they were everybody was reloading they they had it sort of set up in a in a structure that 
protected the soldiers. But it was, maybe it was fortunate that it was so, so slow firing, that if they had rapid fire guns, they would have, uh, but, but I mean, even they, by then they had invented the Gatling gun, which was the first machine gun. Oh yes, the, the but they did, But fire, they didn't use it yeah. because they thought they'd be wasting too many shells. The business of war is so. strange. Yeah. There was a lot of old time thinking in, in both sides. I mean, and the Confederates, you know, are not much, much better, but they had, they, both sides used some of their own uh, uh, ideas for d new weapons, but, you know, they didn't, fortunately, they didn't make huge changes. Now, the subtitle of your book, Michael, is, And the Controversy That Brought Down a General. That's General Warren. General Warren. Right. So he's the man who's a major general, commands the Fifth Corps, Army of the Potomac, and he's now reduced to basically being dumped. And to stay in the Army, he has to accept the grade of major and work for the Corps of Engineers for basically 20, you know, 15 more years. Now, with the glorious information and knowledge that comes with hindsight, uh, looking at the Civil War as, as you're so, in, so informal, uh, or informed about it, uh, what went right, what went wrong from either side's point of view? Well, I think from the Union perspective, the big problem with the war was Reconstruction. The, if you think about what happened with all the killing and all the dying to prevent slavery from expanding originally and then to eliminate slavery, to allow the South to, after losing the war, to establish the, the system they did, which put black people in a basically a semi-slavery situation for years and years and years until the 1960s when the civil rights unit you yeah. know came about uh, I think that was the biggest tragedy for the South for the Union of course for the South it was that their economy was wrecked uh, their social structure was uh, disrupted seriously and even though they were able to reestablish a structure they are still to this day the poorest states in the Union and, and the, they still have a long way to go to catch up with the... Yes, the politics the of modern time. Uh, right. And we know the war's not over, as we know from, uh, you know, from uh, uh, the, the recent events in uh, Charlottesville, Virginia. Yes, yes. Uh, how do you explain that? Uh, is it just early pride that never gave up, or...? Again, I think the, the Southern people had that pride, never gave up, but then they were allowed to pretty much win the, the social battle. In other words, what they fought for in the, in the war, they lost that, but they were able to set up a system that approximated that to pretty much their satisfaction. Now, did it help the Southern economy? No. Did it help the, the relationships among African Americans and, and, and white people in the South? No, no, no. But for white people in the South, it gave them the upper hand and they, At that least was- they, they felt vindicated? They felt they, vindicated and they felt satisfied. And even though they struggled to like economically, they always knew they had the upper hand politically and socially. Now going back for a little bit, Michael, uh, the economy of the South versus the economy of the North before fighting broke out. Was there a balance in there or was it lopsided? It was very lopsided and it was very different. The, not only was the South agrarian, but it was cash crops as opposed to the North, which often had farms that were self-sustaining, you know, farms for like cattle farms or cow farms, milk farms, uh, corn farms. Smaller farms that people lived on and it lived, whereas the, the South had these plantations. And the purpose of having plantations was to sell the crop, like tobacco, like cotton. You know, they, you didn't use those, you sold them, and they became export products. So their, their economy was very different, whereas the Union had self-sustaining uh, you know, uh, self agriculture, but also industry. The Union had the industry, all the industry, not all, but almost all. They had like three times, four times the, the mileage of railroads. They had many more 
roads themselves, and they certainly had more uh, factories. You know, yeah. and we know from a New England that's where factories <laughs> were sort of uh, specialized. I know. I was born and brought up in Norwich, Connecticut. Okay, that's one of the towns. And in the history of my hometown. Uh, I learned that there was a rifle factory that manufactured the rifles that were used in the Civil War. Wow. And, you know, it's long gone. I, the building probably isn't even in there anymore, but uh, just a, a pinpoint historical note right. of the industry of the North. Looking back at the whole story, the, your book, Confederate Waterloo, and the downfall after the area of Five Forks, Virginia. What feeling do you have about the whole episode in America of the Civil War area? Uh, I think, I think it was a tragedy, and a it represented a failure of leadership of the people before the war, that they would not face the reality that slavery was doomed. I mean, we sort of stopped remembering, but the Europeans were also slaveholding countries. You know, Britain, France, Spain, uh, Italy, they had, they had slave organizations, but they were getting rid of those. Brazil, mm. you know, even the Russians were getting rid of serfdom in the 1863. So they, the United States, who should have been way ahead because we were the democratic country, uh, we were still hanging behind. Uh, it still led to war. Yeah, and it led to and war. Sadly, things always seem to end up with a battle. <laughs> it's unfortunate. Uh, we're, we don't have a battle. We have a battle with the time, as a matter of fact, Michael. Well, Our time sorry, is limited, well, and it's just about over. Well, and I've learned a great deal more than I learned in grammar school. <laughs> <laughs> well, about, I, pre about, I appreciate your taking the time, <laughs> and the I'm glad. And you can learn a great deal more about it, too, in the book called Confederate Waterloo, The Battle of Five Forks, Virginia, and the Aftermath of It. Our guest today, Michael McCarthy, has written a very informative book, and we suggest for more information, you get a copy and read it. And we thank you for viewing today's episode of Books and the World, a presentation of the Cape Cod Writers' Center. Thanks for viewing. Thank you.